This episode originally aired on March 11th, 2022. Our client today is our good friend, Darren Wood from the Defense Diaries podcast. One of my favorites. You should go check that out. Sorry about the audio on this one. I haven't upgraded to Starlink yet, so sometimes Zoom sucks. Okay? I'm sorry. In New Orleans, mm-hmm. do they, is this like a famous story? Like, do you guys learn this in school? Do you guys learn about the Axeman when you're in grade seven? <laughs> school in New Orleans. <laughs> um, no, we don't learn anything in school in New Orleans, ever. You guys help uh, people solve solve mysteries and such. Is that in the right place? You are. Good day to you, sir. How did you find our service? Um, the sign on the front says, if you need us, come inside. So I came inside. I didn't realize the sign was working. Very thorough sign. I don't know if you guys. I told you specificity is, is the key to uh, wealth. That's why I put you in charge of the sign, RJ. Mm-hmm. I typed it out in Comic Sans and then scotch taped <laughs> it to the front of the door. But, but you scotch taped the shit out of it, though. It was perfect. Thank you. So, yeah, I got this whole X-Men murder New Orleans situation that no one can seem to figure out. Uh, give me a hand with that. Yeah. An elite team of private detectives. What if balloons are aliens? Like maybe that's the key component we're missing. Cover-ups. John's guilty. Mysteries that need to be solved. Maybe Mormons need mountains. Richard, shut up. Do you guys know anything about the Axeman? I know I know Darren does, but you two other dicks you know anything about the Axeman in New Orleans? I know you do, RJ. You are talking mm-hmm. about it. Yeah. Not at all. Okay. This is good. This will be fun. Good. All right, so the one we're doing today is uh, kind of a brutal one. Uh, the Axeman in New Orleans killed six people and injured six others over the course of just over a year in the early 1900s. His signature kill was with an axe, but the Axeman also used other objects he could find at the scene, including a straight razor. And he mostly killed Italians. So that's... Uh, that, that is a big bonus point uh of his for me <laughs> sicilian specifically uh, <laughs> this is the second week in a row we've been ragging on italians so is is there still a huge italian population in new orleans there god um, willing not anymore i think the exporter there's at least at least six less you, know? <laughs> you, just, you gotta start somewhere <laughs> The serial killer known as the Axeman has never been identified, but we're going to fucking crush this mystery today because why not? We got to go back to the early 1900s for this one. Uh, usually I bring us into the 1800s, so we're, we're this is more contemporary. <laughs> uh, right, right back to 1918, uh, May 23rd, in fact, that's my wife's birthday. Actual birthday, my wife is 104 this year. Nice. <laughs> it's not Piccadilly or whatever. <laughs> yeah. She's cradle robbing and you're grave robbing. Yeah, exactly. Richard, I think we've agreed that we're not going to give up our sources for our early 1800s. All right. Let's yeah, not okay. tell people where we get all of our information from. So Joseph and Catherine Maggio were asleep in their bed after a hard day working in their grocery store. The Sicilian immigrants had run a, his family owned grocery for six years respected and well-known members of their community. Mr. and Mrs. Joe is what they were known around the neighborhood. They had no kids, but their store was a fixture. They actually, uh, it, a lot of people that had grocers back then actually lived in the back of the store. They don't really have that anymore with like Walmarts and shit, but back in the day, you'd be like live in the front part or in the back part. And then the front would be like your store. This is for most of the victims today. They were all Italian grocers, which is very specific. And they also happen to hate jazz, every one of them. The, the Italians, yeah, they like crooning music, you know, like Frank Sinatra shit. They don't like the good <sighs> jazz. They like the slow jazz. <laughs> when, when was this again? <laughs> 1818 or 1918. Yeah. They're just, <laughs> so they hated all music because they knew one day Frank Sinatra would be born. Exactly. <laughs> I'm just waiting for that good shit in like 200 years. <laughs> So Joseph's brother, Andrew, who was a barber, lived in their house as well. They didn't have a barber shop in their grocery store. That would be kind of weird. It wouldn't be like a grocery barber house. Uh, It was just a grocery house. The barber shop was in the same building, but it was two stores beside. 
directly beside the grocer and between, I guess, between the grocer and the barber, there was like a bar. I just think it would be gross if they did have the barber shop in the grocer, like Miss Joe slicing off a hunk of fucking salami and Mr. Joe sleeping on the couch in the back while Andy gives mm-hmm. you a buzz cut behind. That's disgusting. Yeah, and they're they're Italian, so so <laughs> it would track. Yeah. It's they're Italians, they're gonna get hair in their food anyway. Is that what you meant by that? Oh yeah. That anyway, so the Maggios are sleeping in their bed. And we know this because Andrew came home that night at about 2 a.m. after a long night of drinking at the bar next door. Uh he had actually gotten drafted to World War One and he was People keep writing celebrating, but I don't think anybody really fucking celebrates when they get drafted to war. I think he was going there to get drunk because he's fucked. You know, like, I think he's just like, my life is probably, I'm Mm -hmm. probably dead. So let's get hammered. But when he got home at 2 a.m., he said that Joseph and Catherine were already in bed and they were already sleeping. So all three, I guess, Joe or Andrew went and passed out in his bed and they slept soundly till about 445 when Andrew is awoken by the sound of moaning coming from his brother's room that was directly beside them. Andrew wakes up. I'm assuming, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm assuming he thought he was fucking. He thought him and the wife were fucking. He like smashes on the wall, like shut up in there. There's people trying to sleep. And then the moaning got worse and he realized, Oh, they're not fucking. That's uh, something bad's happening. You know, it's not that it's not happy moaning. It's bad moaning. So, Andrew bursts into his brother's room to check on them. Just kidding. Uh, What he does is he runs outside in fear and he goes to get his other brother, his other two brothers who live nearby, uh, which I find hilarious. Like the whole, that's so Italian, you know, like 15 brothers live in within four house lengths. So he runs and he goes to get his brother and he brings his brother posse back uh, to the house grocery store. And they knock down the door of Joseph and Catherine's room to find their brother and his wife in a bloody mess. Catherine was on the floor, essentially decapitated in a pool of her and Joseph's blood. Joseph was laying diagonally on the bed with his feet on the ground beneath his wife. Joseph was actually barely alive, still breathing, moaning. He was the one moaning for fucking someone help me, basically, I'm guessing. (laughs) Or maybe liked it, I don't know. They call an ambulance. Ambulance shows up as they get him to into the back of the ambulance. He dies before they can shut the door. I'm sorry. Is it 1800 some things and they had an ambulance? 18, it's 19, 8, 1918. Still, what the fuck is an ambulance in 1918? We don't have roads now. Back then, yeah, it's just a fucking airboat with some guy going, wee woo, wee woo. <laughs> he was doing that anyway. It's not because it was just happy. <laughs> The Cajun siren on the happiness. In 1918, they would have had cars, but there would have been very few and far between. But yeah. I'm guessing the ambulance would have been one of the very few cars that existed. But it would have had like those big spoke wheels and shit. It wouldn't have been efficient. Because like right now we still have roads. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real issue. Oh my god! It's just a paramedic who's like, hop on, like he just carries you like backpack. Yeah. <laughs> you probably aren't gonna make it, but you can get on if you need. I'm not today. We're going slow. Get out of the way, I got died Italian by my back. Right. <laughs> After investigation, it was shown that the intruder must have jumped the fence around the back of the house, used a chisel to cut out a manhole inside the locked door. So he cut the panel out with a chisel while everyone was sleeping. Jumps through the manhole and he grabs an axe that he found in the backyard and brings it in with him. Then Axe in Hand walks through their house door and goes into the room where Mr. and Mrs. Joe were sleeping. As they slumber, the Axe Man slits the throat of Joseph first. Catherine probably wakes up with the warm feeling of blood all over her body, and there was blood splatter seven feet long all the way up the wall onto the ceiling. She gets up to run or tries to fight him off. I'm guessing run, because if I saw that, I'd be like shocked. I wouldn't be like, I can save you, Mike. You know what I mean? Like, I think I'd get out of there. You're already covered in blood. So she gets up to run, I'm assuming. And the axe man slits her throat as well. But he gets her real good. He gets her right down to the fucking past the jugular. Kind of like Nicole Brown Simpson. Like, turned mm, her into a human border, pez. Borderline, yeah. Nice. I, I, I already think it's, I think the brother did it. Sorry if I remember sure in the whole point of the show. But the brother's one of the theories for sure. We still get paid. We still get paid, right? Um, yeah, if he oh, yeah. He, it. <laughs> okay, because yeah, we facilitated sure. it. 
I thought I, I, I just became like part of I work with y'all now. So I thought that's what happened. What happens? Well, you can uh, work um, with us if you pay us. Yeah. <laughs> for the privilege. Hey, but then, that, that does apply because it's kind of like a therapist. You know, it's like you just you just say things that you already know are true, but they enable you to realize your own feelings. We enable people to solve their own mysteries. It says about I'm taking this about as seriously as I've taken therapy for head. So it feels it feels good. Pretty <laughs> <laughs> so you you understand the concept then perfect and i was confused until just now <laughs> this this episode sponsored by betterhelp.ca anyways <laughs> do you produce a podcast from your own fucking basement and think about maybe not doing anything ever again better help <laughs> from the same computer that you can see your shitty reflection in better <laughs> For the initial slow, uh, throat slits on both Mr. and Mrs. Joe, he used the straight razor. The barber's house, it was found at the scene. And Andrew slept through the whole thing. You know, I've been drunk, though. I've passed out. I've slept through a lot of crazy shit before. So I get that part, I guess. But he slept through the whole thing. I mean, I killed my brother and his wife once. And I know how I got away with it. So, <laughs> yeah. But the fun part about the fun, I shouldn't say fun. It's not fun. It's fucking murder, but I mean, it's not a years ago. But the fun part about the whole thing is that the ax man's name is the ax man for a reason. It's not the, the razor man. So he brought that ax in with him. So he already cut both their throats, but instead he just decides he's going to bash Mr. Maggio's head in with the ax after they're both already throat slit. Is that Maggio or DiMaggio? It's Maggio. I wish it was DiMaggio. It'd be funnier. <laughs> so close. So, yeah, he had axe slashes all over his body, including his head. He had a fractured skull. Uh, and he still survived, which I find crazy. Um, <laughs> they don't want to tap and fucking get her done, you know? <laughs> fucking, you know <laughs> take some bashing and keep whatever I'm bashing that's insulting to Italians. <laughs> I don't, it's not very insulting, actually. It's kind of implying that like Italians are like fucking Toyotas. It's not like, what I just... at all. <laughs> Not what I mean at all. Said, no, just I mean, to clarify, no. I would like to go on record and say that I was not trying to say anything positive. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I love Darren. <laughs> this is Bob, by the way. I want to say this. Yeah. Anyone can hear my voice. Um, this is obviously Bob, or whatever he sounds like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't really know why he did it. I just think it's because he brought it with him. That's why he, he's like, I brought it. I must as well use it. It's heavy. <laughs> Doesn't waste time. You know what I mean? Doesn't waste actions. Very efficient, man. So the Axeman flees back from the back of the house where he came through the manhole and leaves the axe where they die. Uh, beside the axe, the investigator investigators found a chisel. So that's how they thought he, that's what they, why they thought it was a chisel that he chiseled through the door. No fucking thief. <laughs> I'll smash their heads and slit their fucking throats, but I'm not a fucking thief. <laughs> I'll leave the axe where I found it. Yeah, exactly. He didn't steal anything either. That's exactly. one of the big things about this. None of these were financially motivated. <laughs> there was an open safe and there was an empty safe. It was open and empty, but they had just done a huge deposit earlier in the day. So they think that the Maggio's already, like, there wasn't like that was stolen from. Same the Maggio's, and I hear the Maggio every time. Yeah, it's just Maggio, sorry. The Maggio. Yeah, we'll just change it for now. Refer to him as the Maggio, and then you can say it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sure. Why not? Of of Maggio. Like this has like been the key the whole time. This is why they couldn't solve it because they kept saying Maggio. It's actually D Maggio, and if you take the D, anyways, this is how we're going to solve it. So that's why we did it in the yard next door. Detective Steel Orbits, or Orbits, and Harry Dobson. Detective Harry Dobson find some blood soaked clothing it's like the axe man changed his clothes before leaving like he just stripped down got all the bloody shit off must have had some sort of backpack or something or he was andrew and just got changed in his room question real quick why why is it yep. every time we do something old timey the names always sound made up as fuck yeah i know hey, it's true harry dobson is literally the most fucking made up detective name <laughs> Especially for the early 1900s. It sounds like a fucking Mad Men character. They should at least go with like a, um, a New Orleans sound and name or whatever, you know? It's right. not even, yeah. I've, never, I've never heard any of these fucking... What? <laughs> he famous fucking Dobson, New Orleans family. They own yeah. Dobson. 
tabs. You're actually going to be shocked, I think, of what the population was early 1900s in uh, New Orleans, because I was shocked. I, I will get to it, but I mean, there was a lot of fucking Italians, like way more than I thought. Sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> a block down the street, detectives find, written on the sidewalk in chalk, quote, Miss Maggio is going to sleep tonight just like Miss Tony. Uh, and then the story hit the paper the next day with headlines like, couples hacked to death with axe and sleep so like they didn't fuck around with headlines back then they did not make you have to figure out the details like we had a couple of clues for you (laughs) (laughs) i have a question about this chalk situation sure he doesn't bring a fucking axe but he brings sidewalk chalk with him is this is this (laughs) for it (laughs) (laughs) It, there are little axes all every piece of chalk was shaped like an axe (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> he originally wanted to be known as the new orleans chalk man <laughs> right yeah. he's still alive the creole chalk man the chalk man never died <laughs> <laughs> oh, it could have been honestly it could have been just like some kids who left their chalk out while playing hopscotch i don't know if they had chalk like that back then i don't even know how common chalk was they did find a message saying about miss maggio though and about that- miss tony that's Southern hospitality at its finest, right there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just a heads up, guys. Um, if you uh, keep walking this way, there's a bloody fucking mess of these Italians I left. Heads up. We're, we're on the sidewalk. God bless. <laughs> right. And a good day to you, sir. <laughs> After seeing the chalk message, the detectives start pulling up uh, cases from years prior that involved someone with the last name tony because they're like if there's miss maggio sleeping there must have been a murdered lady named tony and they came across four other axe murders from 1911 <laughs> that were all victims <laughs> they were all italian grocers they came across like they just had these lying around they're like well no one's gonna solve these better put them over there <laughs> well it's not like they had the internet and they just like Nobody remembers like 10 years or like eight years. Nobody remembers seven, seven years. years? Been to New Orleans. RJ, they move on. Okay. You got to learn to move on. <laughs> it's because they're Italian. That's why they're like, all right, put it in the Italian box. We're never going to look at it again. True. I was right yeah. in the old Italian box. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> oh, stop talking about my mom. Anyways, the, the four from uh, 1910, they're 1910, 1911 have been done, debunked as Axeman murders because the MO just doesn't match. But a lot of people do mention them if you're going to go, go out and read about the Axeman murders. Wait, no, hold, hold the fuck up. How does, how does the MO not match? It's Italians murdered I, I'm by an axe. Oh. Yeah, I'll tell you why. One of them was an axe. Out of all four of those, one of them was an axe. The other thing, they all said guns. The axe was brought, first of all. Some of them were cleavers that people were chopped up with. It wasn't... The guy was called the cleaver when he first came out into the four murders. He wasn't even called the axe man. He was called the cleaver in the papers. They put them together because it's it's easy, but the, if you look at it from like a today standpoint, he they didn't break in that way. They asked for money. They talked to the, the victims before. The guys who came in with the cleavers are like, give us all your money. Now there's no money motivation. Uh, one guy got shot in the fucking head. They brought a revolver to the thing. So uh, it's not really the same, but they are brutal and they all do involve a sharp, heavy blade. So kind of, you can put them together, but looking at it from today's lens, they say not really. It starts in 1918, the Axe Man, the Cleaver is a different guy whenever it's got. Hmm. I think you gotta um, work your way up to Axe. I think I think the Axe evolution starts with Cleaver. You know, that's, you, that's yeah, true. The Cleaver didn't really that's fucking. True. Yeah, and then and then it ends with the gun, the secret. It shoots axes. It's a gun. Sh- it's an uh. axe shooting gun. <laughs> the next one. So you're talking about the next axe man will be an axe gun guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. Are you claiming that? Like, is that your legacy or what? <laughs> if I- man, it's all yours. I'm sorry. Do you want it? I'm going out in a hail of axes. If I go out, I'm going on a hail of axes. All right. That'd be fucking sick, dude. Yeah. <laughs> it is a good way to die. For sure. I have a couple of unrelated questions, but I guess I don't really. He, he was shot to death with an axe. <laughs> New Orleans is crazy. <laughs> All right. So one of the one of the four victims was last name Tony. Though he was chopped up with. I think that was the one that was shot. So it doesn't really make sense, but it does make sense that they might have been connected at some. They must have been connected in some way. 
but nobody ever caught the connection. It was 1918, and plus it was Italians. Nobody liked Italians, Italians back then. We'll yeah. get into it. <laughs> back then. Well, even now. It never changed. But back then, worse. I'd like to be upfront about the fact that I am half Italian, and I feel justified in being ethnically unkind to them. My son's half. Oh, half so if he's half Italian, then yeah, I justify being unkind yeah. to them as well. Cool. <laughs> as long as, as long as I can share that with you. And... Did you say your son's half? Yeah. Well, my ex-wife's from Sicily, so. Oh, New Orleans. New Orleans. honestly, you have way more of a right to hate them than I do. Then, even being yeah, half they Italian. Me all the time. <laughs> yeah. Married for four years, and um, still that was that was eighteen years ago. The bitter taste of garlic is still in your mouth. Oh God. <laughs> that was my favorite part <laughs> easily the best part of that relationship that's fucking hilarious uh, better help us. <laughs> yeah better help <laughs> us. Yeah. Uh, if they don't sponsor us just go there anyway they're not going to <laughs> i'm sorry to burst your bubble <laughs> yeah we have this this podcast that's weirdly racist against Italians asking us to do a sponsorship. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do we feel about that? Italian is not a race for the record. I agree. I agree. <laughs> I'm I'm unhappy with the the verbiage I use there because that is what so many Italian people use. They 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 claim that they are not white, and that drives me crazy. But they hate everyone else that's not white too, from my experience. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so the most racist people I've ever met in my Italian life. Race is like um, you know. It's a walking race for sure. It's not. It's not to the top of the uh, the, the dean's list. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a scholastic race. That's for sure. <laughs> I've seen Jersey Shore. I understand. Back to 1918. A little over a month after the Maggio murders, on June 27th, 1918, another Italian grocer is attacked in the middle of the night. Louis Bessemer, who lived behind his grocery store like the Maggios, and his mistress Harriet Lowe were attacked with his own axe by a shadowy figure in the middle of the night. Bessemer and Lowe were both Polish. Oh, yeah, this guy's not Italian. He's the only one that's not Italian. Hey, Bessemer's he's not Italian. No, he's the only one who's not. I forgot. I wrote that down. Now I feel bad. Polish? You feel care bad. about the Polacks? I'm sorry. Are they not Italian? That was racist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go be straight up with this right off the top. I'm not Polish. I just don't like Polish people. All right. Um, oh okay then yeah that's fine then i'm in chicago <laughs> you're gonna get him in trouble out there <laughs> boulevard or whatever i am i'm gonna look around the polish gangs that roam around <laughs> that's where all the violence in chicago comes from <laughs> the van buren boys or whatever <laughs> <laughs> all right so low or bessemer and low were both polish they're the only ones that weren't italian sorry my fault for saying italian that's not what i meant uh, they were grocers, though, so the similarity that way. They were found in a pool of their own blood at 7 a.m. by the bakery delivery man, John Zanka. Louis Bessemer had been hacked in the head with his own axe, fracturing his skull. Lowe was struck with an axe over her left ear, which got hacked off. Her ear actually was severed from her head. Both were still clinging to life, but unconscious. This is what I find. This is the craziest part about the story. This guy's attacking people with axes in their sleep and he's not killing them. It makes zero sense to me. I don't know how that could even happen. I mean, he's just very weak. I mean, what, what are they giving you? Um, uh, this, are they saying where this, like, actually where this happened? The actual address of the um, location, perchance? I, it did. But I didn't include it because I thought it was useless. But obviously, <laughs> the, what you're going to ask me for is that uh, it's in the lower French Quarter or something like that. They all, a lot of Italians, it was in the French Quarter. Okay. I mean, the French Quarter. I don't know. Small, the, streets, but... the streets were there. The streets were there. But I didn't put them down. But obviously, you're going to ask for that. You didn't write that part down. So I don't even really give a shit. I just wanted to bring it up because I knew you didn't do it. No, it was a good way <laughs> to point out how, <laughs> <laughs> how ineffective. I, I guess we are being detectives. Can you, can you, can you detect the location of, of this crime? <laughs> I, could, I could definitely tell you. It would just take me a couple seconds. Yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah, no, our listeners don't want the facts, please. Yeah. Just, just the bullshit. <laughs> just, actually, just make up an address. I doubt anyone will double check it. 652 Jerry Street. Jerry Street. Nice. Uh, that sounds <laughs> fake. Uh, and that, Jerry uh, Street? You don't lo think local... Right? Locals know not to, if you're Polish, don't go down 625 Jerry Street uh, after dark. Especially, yeah, the six, six and 700 specifically. Yeah. 
yeah, so Bessemer actually recovered from his injuries, getting smashed in the head twice with a fucking axe. But Lowe died on August 5th, seven weeks after the initial attacks. Seven weeks. Yeah, she didn't die from the wounds, though. She died two days after a surgery to repair the fucked up nerves in her ear area where her head was chopped, half chopped off. Uh, so she died in surgery trying to repair her fucking already smashed up face. I think I think it still counts, though, right? Yeah, I guess so. It also probably is heavily dependent on what nerve surgery in fucking 1918 looked like. Because yeah, exactly. I'm, I, like, I'm picturing it's probably as like gentle and, and delicate as hitting her in the side of the head with a fucking axe. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now the way we fix the, the nerve damage is we hit her with the other side of the axe, the blunt side. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> just reverse it. Bessemer and Lowe were actually in the center of like a media frenzy after the attack, not really because of the attack, but because of what the shit Lowe was saying when she was came out of it. She was all smashed up and she was saying she's crazy. She, she was saying that Bessemer, he was a German spy uh, and she could prove it because he had letters in the house that were in all sorts of different languages. But I mean, we can't rule it out. Oh, you here we go. Spy theories. I do love the spy theories. When, because when do spy theories not work? When they're Polish spies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can hear Darren changing his theory as we speak. So, the part of the media frenzy thing, I'm just trying to summarize it real quick because it's kind of stupid. But I mean, they said that they were husband and wife when the attack happened, and everyone was saying his wife was attacked. And then his real wife came back from, she was in like Chicago or something. She showed up back and she's like, I'm actually married to Bessemer. This is just his mistress. So then they started to not trust Lowe because she was saying everyone was trying to arrest Louis. They were trying to get him, put him in jail right away because they wanted to get the media off the whole thing. So him being a German spy, fuck, that's perfect. Let's make that guy the bad guy for sure. But then the wife came and she's like, no, nah, this guy's my my husband. And I don't know what the fuck this chick's talking about. Wait, so they didn't vet? They didn't like look into the woman at all? They were just like, yeah, no, yeah, you're his, his wife. It's 1918. What are they, they don't have the internet. Okay, but then, ha- okay, if they didn't know what they were talking about because it was the year, what did they do when the other one came back? And then they had to figure it out. It's like, oh, fuck it. This guy just has got two wives, I guess. No, he was like, they were, they were lying because that girl didn't want to be called a whore back in the day, really. You know what I mean? They, they were just like trying to save face. All it did was prove that she was lying and then she died. Interestingly enough, though, on the day she died, which was August 5th of 1918, another alleged attack from the Axemen took place. Uh, 28-year-old pregnant Anna Schneider was awoken by a dark figure standing over her in the middle of the night. The figure then bashed her face in with a lamp that had been sitting on the nearby table. Uh, Her scalp had been cut and her face was full of blood. The axe man uh, had broken through the window, which uh, which had been shown to be forced to be open. So he like jammed through the... And then they, they also had like mosquito netting over everyone back then because there was no AC and shit like that. So yeah. they cracked the windows, but nobody wanted to get bitten by mosquitoes. So everyone would have, so the Axeman like actually cut through the mosquito webbing too, but he can't bash their heads in properly. He, they woke up, she woke up before it even, he could do anything. Can we talk about the Schneider last name, not being Italian also? She's, she's Italian though. Sorry. How the fuck is she Italian? Last name Schneider. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Don't ask me. Her husband might not have been Italian, but she was. Maybe her husband was what's Schneider? What would that be? Jewish? Yeah. Maybe maybe he was a German spy trying to ingratiate himself with the Italian community, but then for <laughs> some reason did not change his last name. None of the people in this we are burning Italian story are Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like that was Somebody should have noticed that by now, is all I'm saying. I, I personally of uh, the the Anna Schneider one, I don't think is the Axeman. Personally, I because it's he doesn't even use yeah. an axe in this one. He just smashes her with a, uh, with a lamp. Yeah, and which so she, I I would I would like to say I doubt in the middle of the night she was awoken by a dark figure standing over her. I'm pretty sure she was probably awoken by the lamp smashing her head. Yeah, I think that would be the. See, she survived. So this is from her account. So uh, I don't know. I Maybe don't believe she... her. I feel like I, I gotta say I feel like I missed or we missed. There's like a Van Gogh joke in that last that last scenario. <laughs> like, yeah, can we rewind real quick? I've been putting it together. 
<laughs> it's in there somewhere with the whole ear getting chopped in. Fucked up yeah. that opportunity. <laughs> she was all smashed up, and she was found uh, by her husband Ed at around midnight that night. Uh, she survived uh, the whole thing, and she gave birth to a healthy baby girl two days after the accident. I believe she's Italian now. Yeah, <laughs> converted. <laughs> she wasn't even pregnant before the attack. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> she mysteriously God, got pregnant. God bless her. Uh, her survival. With a, a new, a new, brand new baby. <laughs> yeah. the, the only reason they like attribute this to the axe man at all is because it wasn't financially motivated and it was in the middle of the night looming over top of her bed. There was no axe involved with this one. But the ones from 1911 where they're all axed to death and Italians, those definitely weren't him. There's a seven year gap between them too. Usually serial killers, if they're going to keep killing, they're going to just start going more and more often until a rampage happens. They're not going to take, usually if they're going to take cool down periods, they're going to kill, take a year off, kill, take six months off, kill, take three months off, kill, 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 kill rampage, get caught. Like not kill a bunch of guys for take seven years off. But there's, there's people that say that maybe he was in jail. He was in the military. He was sent off somewhere or he just traveled the country. Who knows? You're right. I, I just don't, I don't, the way they read, it doesn't read the same. And people have said like a lot of Axeman experts have discounted them. So I kind of just took them out. Otherwise this episode could go on forever. Yeah. Please continue with your detective. Work. Okay. All right. <laughs> After the Schneider attack though, is when they start connecting these things together. So that's the only good part that comes out of the Schneider, whether it's an Axeman or not. They said, oh, guy's been breaking into people's houses in the middle of the night and uh, assaulting people. So that's why that's why they started connecting them is because of Schneider. Whether she did it or not, that's fine. So five days after that attack, Joseph Romano, another Joseph and another Italian grocer, was attacked by the Axeman. Romano lived with his two very young nieces, Pauline and Mary Bruno, And in the early morning hours of August 10th, 1918, heard a commotion in their uncle's room. When the two nieces entered the room, they saw their uncle covered in blood with serious blows to the head. He had two significant head wounds and the nieces called for an ambulance right away. They were 15 and 13, I believe. As they found their uncle, they saw the assailant fleeing the scene with an ax in his right hand. The two teenage girls described him as a heavyset, dark-skinned man wearing a dark suit and a slouched hat. So now it starts getting weird because he's a heavy set dude climbing through a fucking door panel. You know, he, keep, he keeps the axe all of a sudden. Earlier, he, he left, he used the axe from the house and left it there. Yeah, no, he actually drops it outside when he leaves, but he takes it, he runs out with it. He leaves it there though, basically. And it was oh. found there too. It was their axe. I like how they added in the dark skinned, you know, so let's just throw someone under the bus who's dark skinned. Why not? It goes to say that they think it might be a Sicilian because the Sicilian had the darker. What I what I want to I want to know who those people were that they talked to though. Were they white? They're Italian. Everybody's everybody's Italian, right? Yes. It was the two girls. His nieces saw them him running out. The two young Romano girls. Their last names are Romano. They're Italian as well. They lived in the house with the attack. They their uncle was being attacked. I, I didn't I didn't realize it was the nieces. I thought I thought you were saying two like random people outside saw it. They're repeating this to the police officers after the attack happened. Okay, got it. Yes. Got that. Their uncle Joe Romano was highly injured, but he was able to walk and get up into the ambulance. The axeman did the same thing as the other. He like chiseled out the door panel and squeezed through there, apparently. Uh the bloody axe was found in the backyard, much like the other scenes. Unfortunately. Two days later, even after though he, even though he walked out with the ambulance, he died of his injuries in the hospital. So head injuries are fucked up, man. Bob Saget just died that way. You know, go get your head checked. You get smashed. That's how Bob Saget died. <laughs> head injury. Yeah. I just hmm. assumed he was. Old. I didn't even read any of the articles. I just assumed old. I, th- I thought drugs. Yeah, I thought it was going to be drugs too. Yeah. Um. So I a, after a shitty full house joke, but. I'm not going to make it because Bob Saget. His Aristocrats bit is the best one in the Aristocrats. I didn't know Bob Saget was in the Aristocats. Was he the, was he the one playing piano? Yes, he was in the Aristocats for sure. Meow, meow, fucking meow. That's cool, dude. He's had such a rich filmography. <laughs> <laughs> so after Joseph's murder, uh, it was becoming apparent there was a trend and it wasn't going unnoticed by anyone. The citizens, the police, the media were putting this all together. All of this was being reported by the local media. 
What was happening in New York, New Orleans, I saw it described as extreme chaos. This guy was kind of starting to be described as the American Jack the Ripper. Uh, but like I said, he Americanizes the fuck out of it with an ax. You know, that's way cooler than the fucking Jack the Ripper. And, and Italian and, immigrants instead of whores. And apparently he's fat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he might as well be draped in like a American flag cape or something. Yeah, exactly. A, yeah. a very large American flag cape. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they're in the papers. They were starting to put stuff on the cover of the paper, like who's the next Italian to die from the axe man? Like that's how much panic was getting thrown around. Like seriously, it was it was the sports section of, of the paper. They were taking bets. Yeah, yeah, it's a Coliseum <laughs> sports section. Uh, it actually said Italians in New Orleans were starting to wonder who was the next victim. Like that's what it said on the paper. Well, yeah, I mean, knowing Italians, they were all just running to bet on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So people were starting to arm themselves, staying up all night, guarding their houses, pistols, melee weapons in hand. They weren't helping the situation. The media wasn't helping the situation either. And a retired Italian police detective, John Don Tanio, Dan Tonio, Don Dan Tonio, Don John Tonio. Got it. Yeah, yeah. John Dan Tony. Is he one of the three most conspirators? I guess so. Yeah. Uh, D'Artagnan. And yeah, John yeah. D'Artagnan. <laughs> John D'Artagnan. That was he starts was- telling everyone that the recent slew of murders were connected to the floor from 1911. So he starts actually adding more fuel, like the axe man's back. D'Antonio cited the similarities in the attacks and described whoever was doing these things. Jesus Christ, this is a fucking stupid sentence. I am Sound it out. <laughs> D'Antonio cited the similarities in the attacks and describes whomever is doing these attacks as being committed by someone who has a dual personality uh like a jekyll and hyde he was saying basically something we would describe as a fucking serial killer now compartmentalizing Mm. kills and living a normal life during the day just killing random people at night yeah detective uh tony tone tonio is ahead of his time there (laughs) (laughs) he described a serial killer without knowing what a serial killer was basically Hmm. You, you joke, but he owns at least 3% of Giorno's now. So, I mean, fuck off. He's responsible for the rising crust. <laughs> the drop in crime. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. So, yeah. Now, now everyone's super scared and everyone's seeing the Axeman everywhere. Um, Axeman related stuff. Axeman, like people are finding axes in their backyard, calling the cops. You know, like, the Axeman was here. Uh, the X-Men was reported to police on many different occasions as being seen lurking in back alleys. So I guess some fat guys with slow chats were in back alleys. And I was like, the X-Men's there. Um, there was one incident where a man was caught sleeping in someone's backyard. And they're like, X-Men, and chased him off. So everyone was the X-Men after this. That's an awesome approach. The cap- a great approach to capturing the X-Men is, is to run him off when he's sleeping. Yeah, when he was sleeping, though. <laughs> so they, cha- yeah. they, they, they go, X-Men's there. And they got police, 40 police officers and 2,000 citizens chased this fucking guy uh, around the streets of New Orleans. They couldn't catch him, though. They never found him. Uh, but they got, uh, they got Wait a, a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> so it was probably not the Axeman, right? But they got so many people to chase a random dude that was sleeping and they never found him? Exactly. Well, he wasn't sleeping while they were chasing him. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. That was yeah, Rick, you fucking done. idiot. <laughs> I thought. I mean, I, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so all the oh, panic going around. Yeah. There was so much panic running around the city at this time. I think the axe man, whoever he or she was, I mean, whoever she was, axe person. Uh, I like axe it. Axe person. Yeah, axe axe woman. Axe day. Um, so with all the panic brewing around the city, the Axeman took a few months off. I think he saw the, he's like, I'm not going to kill anyone for a bit. Everyone's watching for me. Maybe he just was do, doing his cool down period. I don't know. He just. Hide your axe. Don't, just don't leave your axe outside. That probably would have mitigated. They started yeah. of, yeah. <laughs> put, your, put your axe away. I right. will never. I want to live in a free country where I can put my axe wherever I want. I'm not going to live well, here. Well, that's what they all crammed into that little steamboat all the way from Sicily for, was to live in a land <laughs> of plenty 
of places somebody, to put your axe. Somebody made a journey on Facebook <laughs> <laughs> prior to somehow. <laughs> I think I figured it out. They they weren't able to find him because they the Italians have all these pipes that they can just jump into at any time and then they pop out, out of another <laughs> one. There's this elaborate system. There's no way to find the guy. Maybe the axe man wasn't fat. Maybe he just ate a mushroom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Damn, a little bit bigger than everybody. So he's in a cool off period or something. Nobody really knows what it is. There's a lot of theories as to why he wasn't killing. There was a Spanish flu rolling around in 1918. So maybe he was just sick. You know, maybe he just couldn't kill. Uh, there's a lot of things. Uh, maybe he was an anti vaxxer and he didn't want to isolate. He wanted to isolate. I don't know. I wanted to live in Nazi Germany. <laughs> he walked into a turtle shell. <laughs> World War II, World War One was coming to an end around that time too. So maybe there was just family coming into town or something. You know, Italians and their family. So for seven months, <laughs> who knows? There's just there's just a lot of reasons people say maybe he had a girlfriend. Who knows? Maybe whatever. But he didn't start killing again until March 10th, 1919. Uh, this time he was in Gretna, Louisiana. I guess the, I, from what I understand, that's just across the river. That's not like it's far yeah, from. It's still New Orleans, West Bank. Still West Bank, so it's not even out of. How far would it be to drive to New Orleans? From a a part of New Orleans that matters to anyone to Gretna, um, it's like an eternity, but it's like three miles. (laughs) Oh, okay. Want to go there? I promise. They have uh, unless it's Gretna Fest, then you can go see uh, Steve Winwood or somebody of that nature. (laughs) Go wash. Sign me up. (laughs) Right. Sounds like a pleasant time. And probably hitting the head with a bottle. Nice. It comes with a ticket to Gretna. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, March 10th, 1919, uh, in the middle of the night, Rosie Cortamiglia woke up to her husband, Charles, wrestling with a large man wielding an axe. Their two-year-old daughter, Mary, was asleep with them in bed and when the commotion began. Once her husband was shot to the floor, heavily injured, the axeman turned his rage to Rosie and Mary. Rosie begged for their lives, but the axeman brought his axe over his head and he plunged it into the mother and daughter with no remorse. As screams retched out of the house, a neighbor and fellow grocer, 69-year-old E. Orlando Giordano, and his 18-year-old son Frank went to investigate the commotion. They found Charles on the ground in a pool of his blood, unconscious, and Rosie standing in the door with a serious head wound, clutching her recently deceased daughter in her hands. Uh, What was the neighbor's name? Somebody, e, e. Orlando Giordano. What was his son's name? Frank. Frank. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, yeah, no, that's okay. And we will call him. Uh... <laughs> so Charles and Rosie were rushed to the hospital. In addition to their many axe slashes, they both had skull fractures, but they both survived. Uh, this guy is batting fucking very low on the kill people with axe while they're sleeping. Well, you got one of them. The, he's not he's not bad at cleanup, that's for sure. He's like the eighth, eighth in the lineup. <laughs> he's one for three that night. Yeah, he got the baby though. That's like a half. He doesn't even get a full. Yeah, court. no, he that's good. Full. I mean, axes are slow, babies are small, and they can, you know. I guess, yeah, I guess you're right. That's that's actually better kill because that's pretty it. accurate. Yeah. Are we seeing a baby yeah. the hard target? Yeah, I mean yeah, for, for an axe. I mean, I feel oh, like it's a, gotta you got like a good three seconds from the backswing to get out of the way. So honestly, <laughs> that a, one's on the only, baby. Only functional um, human. It's actually a person. <laughs> totally makes sense though. It's like stealing uh, candy from an adult. Yeah. <laughs> With an axe. Fair um, point. I, I find the fact that they survived it is probably worse, though. They probably should have wanted to die after that. Their baby got slashed in front of them, and they're like, why didn't we die? Like, that's probably worse. I mean, good with the bad. Think of the free time. There's no, <laughs> no one hogging your bed at night now. <laughs> Without that uh, yeah, the little heater between us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Just like, you know, that first night you go to bed without the baby there, you're going to be stretching your legs out. You'll be sad. Then you're like, Ooh, so much space. First 22 months were a, kid, were a breeze. Yeah. <laughs> so it was the last two. The MO matched uh, the Axeman to the T almost. Nothing was stolen. Chiseled door to get in the house. Bloody axe owned by the Cordomiglia family left near the scene of the crime. Charles Cordomiglia and E. Orlando were friends until just recently when they had a falling out because the grocery store that Frank and E. Orlando had just 
opened up near the Cordomiglia. So they just opened a new competing business. Like, why would you do that? We just, we were friends, but they were pissed about them. Rosie pegs E. Or, e Giordano or whatever, E. Orlando as the, mur- as the attackers were responsible. Oh. Pegged them as the person responsible <laughs> for the attack. Like that's, that's some quality revenge if she pegged him. Yeah. Charles, in fact, said his wife is crazy. They didn't do anything. I don't know what you're talking about. My wife's nuts. She got hit in the head with an axe. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Ultimately, the two were arrested, E. Orlando and Frank. Uh, and Rosie's testimony was enough to get E. Orlando and his son put in his son Frank put in jail for the rest of their life and sentenced to death, respectively. So Frank was on death row. Wow. Oh, I'm now I'm confused. Why what happened with their they what did they do? Rosie, the one that got hit, like the one that had the big dead baby in her hand, she yeah. said it was their neighbors. She said it was them who did it. So the cops believed her, even though her husband was like, no, they didn't do it. She's crazy. I don't know what she's talking about. The cops yeah. still arrested them, still got her to put in jail. They still got the old man got life in jail and the young guy got he was six foot two. He was big for the time, but he like big for an Italian. They carried it out. They killed him. Executed. No, we we're going to get to it. No, they didn't get him. They, they she recants her statement. Rosie recants her statement a year later. They kill her. <laughs> no, she never got in trouble. They like kind of dropped it because she lost her kid. They were like, let's just leave this whole thing be. Let's get them out of jail. She just said it was out of jealousy and spite that she even accused her neighbors. They made a store next door. Somebody I feel like they just dropped it without consulting Frank in Orlando. Because if that were me, I would I might be like, no, well, no, hold on. Wait a minute. Uh, no, no, no. We're just going to drop it. She's grieving. You're overlooking the forgiving nature of the Italian people. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> the understanding of forgiving major, the, the, the grudgeless Italians. Yes, is, yes. Of course, just... the, without without feud or rage. We're gonna learn about we're gonna learn about Italian vendetta very soon. Even vendetta is Italian. That's an Italian last name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's an Italian like, term. Vendetta. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, like I said, they were released about a year later after being arrested. Nothing. Maybe they did do some sort of vendetta, but it was not uh, publicized, and it was 100 years ago. So, a couple days after the attack on the Court of Miglias, on March 13th, 1919, the Axeman writes a letter to the local paper, the Times-Picayune, which they print. It's still in print. Is it really? Yeah. The Times-Picayune is, is the, the only, paper. The only paper in New Orleans that still exists in the Crazy. flesh or whatever. Yeah. Still just waiting for people to learn how to read. They're still trying to. <laughs> so here's the letter in its entirety. It's a little long, but it's awesome. It's like my favorite part of the whole story. The letter starts with this. Hell, March 13th, 1919. Like he's saying he's from hell uh, right off the bat, which makes him kind of more like the Jack the Ripper of America, because Jack the Ripper would sign his notes with from hell, right? Esteemed mortal, they have never caught me and they never will. They have never seen me, for I am invisible. Even as the ether that surrounds your earth, I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from your hottest hell. I am what you Orlinians and your foolish foolies call the Axe Man. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know who my they shall be. I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe, be smeared with blood and brains of whom I have sent low to keep me company. Redundant. Yeah. If you wish, you may tell the police to be careful not to rile me. Of course, I am a reasonable spirit. I take no offense at, at the way they have conducted their investigations in the past. In fact, they have been so utterly stupid as to not only amuse me, but his satanic majesty. Francis Joseph, etc. Uh, like, what is who's Francis Joseph? They just said uh, his satanic majesty and Francis Joseph. Is that like the guy? This is right hand man. Is that Satan's right hand man? I didn't know about Francis Joseph. Frankie anyway. Joe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he and Satan Frank. go way back. <laughs> uh, but of Gentleman Lutrucci. Frank. <laughs> Frank. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But tell them to beware. Let them not try to discover what I am, for it were better that they never born than to incur the wrath of the axeman. 
I don't think there is any need of such a warning, for I feel sure the police will always dodge with me as they have in the past. They are wise and know how to keep away from all harm. Undoubtedly, you Orlidians think of me as the most horrible murderer, which I am. But I could be much worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. And at will, I can slay thousands of your best citizens. I am in close relationship with the Angel of Death. Now here's where it gets hilarious to me. This might as well be written in Italian. Now, to be exact, at 12.15 earthly time, on next Tuesday night, I'm going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I'm going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I'm very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing, and at time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going well, then so much better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is that some of you people who do not jazz it out on that specific Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. So you gotta jazz it out. That's a really great way to take the sting out of all the hell stuff. <laughs> like, what What was all the buildup for if you're just going to make it unnecessary? I am a demon from hell here to kill you. But let's play some jazz. I like the jazz uh, music. <laughs> Unbelievable. Here we go. This is the last, set, last paragraph. Well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartarus... It, and it is about time I leave your earthly home. I will cease my discourse, hoping that thou wilt publish this, that it may go well with, with thee. I have been, am, and will be the worst spirit that ever existed, either in fact or realm of fantasy. The X-Men. I'm going to say realm of fantasy, the whole thing. <laughs> Thoughts on that? Anything that's funny to come up before I start keep going with this? I'm, I'm beyond confused. <laughs> To everything. What are you confused about? I, I'm still trying to figure out how hell and jazz overlap. Oh, jazz was like jazz was like the the bad people music. New Orleans then and now now too it was like a mixture of a lot of different cultures, right? So like black people were making jazz. They invented jazz, like modern jazz. So white people were like, that's the devil's music. The black people made it. Yeah, you know. Back then it was so, cool. Uh, today, though, I, I, from my own personal experience, I can say that I have a hard time choosing between being struck with an axe in my sleep and having to listen to jazz. So from that perspective, hell, <laughs> jazz, one and the same. Uh, I'm, I'm not a fan. You see this figure <laughs> really an axe in the night. Um, I'll tell you what. Oh, sorry. Keep going. All of it? All jazz? You don't like any of it? I, I don't get I don't know if it's just because uh, I have anxiety or, or what I don't like the unpredictability of it. It's not comfortable to listen to. There's nothing soothing about just the erratic nature of it. I don't I don't care for it. OK, I was just curious. I don't yeah, like no, that's... <laughs> <laughs> no further comment. <laughs> well, what do you think happened? What do you think happened from this letter? Uh, probably the most awful thing anyone's ever heard for hours on end for one night in new orleans <laughs> each and every jazz club on the night of the 19th was packed party. everybody party. And, exactly yeah yeah you party professional you and amateur bands filled the city with the sounds of jazz people were hiring bands to play in their houses and if they couldn't afford a band to play at their house they went out to they put on the record player and they're blasting jazz can, uh and can you imagine sorry? how fucking horrible that would sound <laughs> just <laughs> Uh, like a hundred thousand different jazz tracks all just blaring at the same time. Honestly, it would actually probably not sound any different than one jazz track blaring. You're, so, you're yeah. <laughs> and I was trying to interrupt you before you get to get the chance to. <laughs> I don't think that radios are as loud back then, though. You know, they had like a horn thing on top of it. I mean, they were probably scared as shit, so they probably did whatever they could to bump that shit. <laughs> Yeah, everyone was terrified. So everyone played jazz, whether they liked it or not. And the axe, I like how the axe men promised there were no murders that night. Uh, the jazz filled streets kept them at bay. Yeah, no, that that were me. Come kill me. I have no respect for a murderer that keeps his word. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
There's nothing sacred, you know what I mean? We can believe this fucking guy. Fuck that. Get out of here. Yeah. They're, here's here's what the people do now. So when they see the letter in the newspaper, some citizens sent their own letters to the paper to be published. One citizen invited the Axeman to come kill him. He must have been like, I don't want to hear all the jazz that night. Just come kill me. <laughs> like <laughs> RJ. It's like, yeah. just print that. Just tell him to come to my house. Uh, another citizen uh, wrote a letter and asked the Axeman was going to kill him. If you're going to kill me, just don't break our door. I'll leave the window open. That's what another letter said. <laughs> I just put the door in. I don't want to be killed. And my door I broke. That, like I leave New Orleans as fuck for some reason. I don't know. I can't pinpoint <laughs> uh, that. It feels like it. Okay, I fucking respect the shit out of that answer, though. That's New Orleans as fuck it really is. Like, um, I, I like, I love, if you're going to kill me, kill me. Don't break my fucking door. Don't be a fucking uh, dick about it, you know? Yeah, the day yeah. after the, the, the letter was printed in the paper, there was a song written about the Axeman. Uh, it was called The Mysterious Axeman Jazz. Don't scare me, Papa. In, in, uh, of course it was. That's, that is exactly the name I would have made up for it. Yeah, written by John Joseph de Villa. I have it. I, I could play it for you guys if you want to hear it, but man, it's not good. It sucks. <laughs> Just um, he wrote it in like four hours. You know, it was, uh, <laughs> he was under pressure. Yeah. Well, one of the funny things that we'll talk about it in the theory, I might just say this part again, but it, one of the funny things is there was a, a guy, like an organ grinder, who was hired that night to run up and down the streets of New Orleans playing this song. So a lot of the people think that this guy just fucking Joe John Joseph de Villa sent the letter in to promote his song because he knew fucking everyone was gonna buy it after, right? He's a goddamn genius. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty yeah, hilarious. I, I give him credit for the hustle. Yet yeah, so. another example of the Times pick a you and getting fucking tricked into advertising for a jazz. <laughs> <laughs> Count on how many hands that, that, how many times that's happened <laughs> yeah that was in march uh when the when the, the jazz stuff so he held off till august 1919 but the, he came back to his old tricks he didn't go away permanently but he definitely stayed away for a bunch of months waited for the jazz to die down uh the 10th of august in the middle of the night steve boko woke up with an axe in his head he's, he's a, Wait a second. <laughs> yep. Can you, can you just reread that last sentence for me, please? On the 10th of that month, in the middle of the night, Steve Boca woke up to an axe or with an axe in his head. That's the problem. He got That's smacked the in the head. That's how he woke up. Okay. Uh, uh, he said he saw a dark figure looming over his bed. Then he lo- lost consciousness, which another guy that fucking survived. Uh, the axe man flees his house, leaving the axe behind. Uh, after regaining consciousness, Boca runs to the street to find out what the hell just happened. And this is where he realizes he's bleeding from his head wound. So I guess he didn't even really notice he got hit until enough to wake him up, but not enough to keep him from investigating. Was the axe yeah. still in his head as he ran out into the street? Yeah. yeah. That's this how he is, this, is this is this something weird about my head right now? I'm hearing my vision. Yeah. Did they <laughs> did they have like fingerprinting available in Almost 1918? Like... They did. Fingerprinting was was invented. Okay, so so if that so if he still had the murder weapon in his head, he just like saved Italians forever. Okay, okay. fingerprinting was exists. He didn't actually have the axe in his head. The th- fingerprinting did exist, but people weren't using it as a common practice in police forces yet. So people weren't fingerprinting thing. It was like very very brand new. So- uh, we don't really buy this fingerprinting bullshit. Yeah. yeah, until they realized they could use it to frame people, then they were all over that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's true. Oh, did you say black people have this too? Let me get on that. <laughs> Who else has fingerprints? <laughs> well, if you look at the if you look at the inner swirl, you can clearly tell that this man was of color. Uh, right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So he goes and passes out outside after he figures out they after like I said nothing was taken from the house the back door was fucking chiseled out again all axe man stuff uh, he did survive but he said he didn't remember anything from the incident all he remembers is seeing a guy and then passing out you got your head smashed in with an axe maybe you don't remember something I'll give him that is there any way that this is like just a bunch of proud Italians and like they're chopping wood and they miss and they just don't want to admit it and they're like oh yeah he's all a big scary guy so Ch- my Ch- actually, <laughs> a related question we don't in New Orleans, 30 degrees every fucking day. I don't know anyone that owns an axe. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, but back then they didn't have uh, like heating like they do now. Like they, everyone would have to have. I haven't turned wood for 10 years. I guess so. Point? You live in a place where it's not cold. Yeah. It's like the northern point of the Caribbean. There's no need for. Yeah, but this was yeah, pre Katrina. So the weather is completely different. Uh, that's a solid point. 
barely, mm. barely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to cook, they wouldn't have wood stove. Like they'd have wood oh, stove to true. cook, right? Like there'd yeah. be there'd be wood needed back then. It would make some calzone. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. How are they gonna make their pizza? Yeah. Not, it is yeah. wood, wood fine. That makes sense. That makes sense. I'll tell you what. I didn't even know that tonight's episode was about Italians, and I had mozzarella sticks. So. <laughs> yes, really? the, the classic traditional Italian cuisine of <laughs> cheese sticks. <laughs> you Look joke, you, you joke, yeah. but I mean, I, I'm fucking I, cultured, all right. <laughs> I dipped him in some nice, fine ketchup uh, sauce. <laughs> all right, the Axe Man's not done yet. He's got one more. Uh, less than a month later, on September 3rd, the Axe Man climbs through a window of a single and living alone Sarah Lawman. And when she's sleeping, she is beaten so badly with the axe that she's found unconscious with a massive head injury on her bed, you missing several teeth. Dude, Jesus. <laughs> also, same MO, bloody axe left on the scene on the front lawn. Sarah also survived, but she also said she doesn't remember the attack. She doesn't remember anything from the attack. And then the last but not least, the axeman strikes one more time. Uh, this time, it's almost Halloween. It's October 27th. Esther Pepitone was awakened by a loud noise that night. Uh, the mother of six rushed into uh, her bedroom just in time to see an axe-wielding man of large stature running out of the room. When she enters the room, she sees her husband, Mike Pepitone, laying in a bloody mess. He had been struck in the head so violently that blood spatter covered the majority of the room, including their painting of the Virgin Mary. And the reason I say the Virgin Mary painting, think it has nothing to do with anything. But for some reason, it's important because it's in every fucking article I read about Pepitone. So I was like, I got to write that. I got to say it out loud for everyone because it's in every article. She's a virgin. Come on. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> uh, that's the official end of the Axeman murders. There's some murders uh, in the late 20s or sorry, in the early 20s that some people consider to be Axeman, but have also been dubbed on. It's an easy way to tell. It's not him because they died. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. He doesn't, um, was, he's fucking there were mostly survivors <laughs> there's six six people died 12 people or six people died 12 sorry six people died six people injured okay but one, one of them was two years old so you round down that's not even mm. gonna count yeah no i agree i think this this guy should have way better kill ratio whoa he killed vincent van gogh's old lady during surgery he killed a baby that's all i remember dying and this that's and true that's true. If those two are trying to be attributed to that count, he's down to four. Pump I think those, those numbers. Kind of Pump maybe. those numbers. <laughs> if you carry the one, the remainder of fuck this guy. <laughs> so that's all the murders, and I'll just kind of go through the theories now, and then you guys can interject here too. Mafia. Uh, <laughs> so that's the first theory basically it's not really a theory it's just kind of like anyway so it's called the theory vendetta the vendetta <laughs> this theory it says that there's not really a specific it's not one axe that. man that's what I'm saying. It, it comes down to cultural differences with the italian population uh being so thick in the new orleans area <laughs> so in the late 19th century after the civil war Plantation owners were looking for cheap labor to replace their now illegal slave workforce. <laughs> New Orleans already had a pretty big can we, Italian population. Sorry. Can we backpedal for a second and how you just referred to Italians like they're smog? They're thick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you said the Italian population was thick. Like <laughs> it was hanging in the air like pollution. New Orleans already had a pretty big Italian population and New Orleans before the Civil War. But once sugarcane and cotton plantations were hiring, Sicilian immigrants flooded to into the port of New Orleans. By 1900, New Orleans had the biggest Italian population in the South, about 20,000 immigrants, including their children, mostly Sicilians. Sicilian immigrants were known to be... Uh, they wanted to get out of being working in the shitty... So they'd save their money. They wouldn't spend their money on... They're frugal. They didn't waste their money. On say, what does the article say? What word does the article say that you're not using? Hmm. Um, if they're just trying to like the reason I'm saying it this way instead of going, it's because it's like fucking five paragraphs for them to say that these Italians like to save their money. We don't like them because they save their money because then they just leave the workforce. That's basically what they're saying. They're like, these guys are too frugal. They don't spend their money. So we always lose our Italians. They go off and make their own fruit stands or whatever. They're not participating so they, they, in their God-given right to capitalism. 
That's yeah. their biggest offense. So that's basically what the 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 stage of this would be. They would go immigrate, go work on the plantation, save for a couple of years, open up like a little fruit stand or something, save up for a couple of years doing that, and then open up a grocery store. And then they buy a, a gold chain with a shark tooth on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Spray tan. <laughs> can I can I say that 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 is literally my landlord's legacy? Uh, well, <laughs> my old landlord. I own a home now. I'm no longer underneath the thumb of an Italian. I, uh, he yeah, his family. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy to slip out because it's all covered in olive oil. But uh, he his family. <laughs> I did. Uh, they they literally opened up a fruit stand around here, and then it was a grocery store, and now they just own fucking business after business after business after like a hundred years. It is the classic Italian American dream. Here's something I didn't really know about the Italian stuff. Like, since Sicilians had a darker skin tone than the white people that worked, uh, and they also worked alongside the black workers in the plantations, white people were like calling them. Oh, dagos that's where the dago yep. names like they might they're just as bad as negroes they're dagos they're just as bad as the chinese they're untrustworthy yes. saving people they're pieces of shit and while that is very racist and horrible uh i will never forgive them for that not because it's racist but because it is all annoying italians we'll talk about now uh in perpetuity even though they're effectively living in 2022 and white for all intents and purposes and gaining all the yeah. privilege from that, they will never let you forget something that happened a hundred years ago to them. Not even. Yeah. Them. And they own, they own like what? 62% of MTV. <laughs> Is that true? Oh. No, I don't know. I got the joke. It was a good joke. It was a good joke. That's crazy. If it is true. That exact number is true. It'd be really weird. Especially that specifically. Yeah. So just so you guys know, by 1880, seven percent of all grocers in New Orleans were Italian owned. By 1900, 19 percent, and by 1920, half the grocers were Italian owned in New Orleans. So, with a large influx of Sicilians came the ways from the old country. In the old country, Sicilians didn't trust the police and took care of their issues themselves, if you know what I mean. So the immigrants, uh, so as the immigrants came to America, they were same issues. They didn't want to trust the police. And they wouldn't go to the authorities if there was any problems. They'd just do the vendetta, which is a, basically a, a Italian term for a blood. The, the NPD, NPD is very trustworthy. I just want to, I just want to go on record and say that the New Orleans Police Department, you can definitely trust them. Yes, yeah, so I, I don't know what they're talking about with that one. <laughs> is that sar- is that sarcasm? Because uh, well, of course. I feel- Good. I was like, is he being serious right now? Because I absolutely went, fucking big, not. Big- no. <laughs> no, not at yes. all. So they they just did their own thing. And I think this is why a lot of the the people didn't remember the attacker because it was some sort of Italian vendetta uh, coming back at them. Like a grocer up the street didn't like the fact that you opened up a fucking grocery store. So they called the black hand, which is what they called the mafia. Yeah. You don't don't get, you don't take my extortion. You don't pay for my my $50 a month or whatever for protection. Then it come fuck you up. Like it, the classic extortion story. <laughs> uh, you pay me to protect you from me. You know, same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In the in the late 1800s, early 1900s, Decanter Street had so many stabbings and gun fa- fights. It was nicknamed Vendetta Alley. So I don't know if Decanter Street means something to you, but I think that was kind of fun. Deca- Decatur Street. They spelled that wrong. Okay, Decatur Street. Autocorrect probably changed it to De- Decanter. You know, when I was typing. <laughs> Like I said, the black hand, the mafia would settle all their scores for them. Uh, the authorities wouldn't even help them, even if they went to them anyway. They just call them stupid dagos. Do you know where that comes from? I don't, I don't know where dago comes from. I do. I just uh, it's because they would work alongside the Negroes, so they just started calling them dagos because they're like bright. They're not as dark, so it's like a dagro. Like it came from being like Super it's just yeah, it's. Just racism, Brandon. Yeah, totally. I know that uh, uh, where the, you know, without papers is also like a, a WAP. Yeah, without yeah. papers. Yeah. Yeah, that's. It's, I do. I just didn't know where. Yeah, I think this is why Rosie, the one that lost her, her baby or whatever, and Charles probably denied it because he knew it was Vendetta, but she was like, "You, you went too far. You killed my kid, so I'm going to tell on you." And then Vendettas just go worse and worse with these mafia types. So they shut their mouth. 
I, I think the mafia probably would have like a crazy axe guy that would break into houses and do axe shit. You know what I mean? That that he could the axe man could just be a hitman or like someone like that, or someone who would would just take a fucking axe from a house and kill someone. Fucking psychos. And they probably all knew who this guy was, the whole Italian neighborhood, but they just weren't saying anything in fear of more retribution. But there's a couple problems with this theory in general. Uh, John D'Antonio, our our Italian retired police officer at the time, uh, he was considered the expert of the mafia in the New Orleans area. He said that if it were the mafia, no one would have survived. They would have actually killed them. There wouldn't have been any like bouncing off thick skulls of Max. That is a classic over dramatic Italian statement right there. Right. We don't we don't even fail at killing <laughs> ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody kills Italians like Italians uh, kill Italians. <laughs> <laughs> this guy here was more on the serial killer camp though, which mm-hmm. it does have an MO and it does do stuff like that. But at the same time, uh Hitman has MO. Hitmen have MOs. That doesn't necessarily mean they're serial killers if they're doing it for Serial killers are like what? Do it for pleasure. Uh, Hitman would do it for money, financial gain. I think there's like yeah. very the the requirements to be a serial killer are, are pretty few. I think you just have to kill two people. To kill two people at a span of time, like you can't just go uh, shoot a school up. You're a mass killer. Mass killer. killer. There's mm-hmm. there's things, but you're not really a serial killer if you're a hitman because you're not doing it. How many schools do you have to shoot up to be a serial killer? You have to do serial mass murder. That would be interesting. at least two. That would be interesting. Is it? Yeah, is it at least. But they have to fit a criteria. It's just the way they're 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 all pieces of shit. It's just the way they're categorized. So you can profile them. It just makes it easier to figure out what this kind of person would be if you can put them in their different category. So like if you're mm-hmm. a serial killer, you're more likely like have a job that doesn't require you leaving the house or something. You're a loner. You don't have many friends. They, or if you're mass murder, probably the same shit. Just your parents are Republican gunheads. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. We both said the same thing, just in different words. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the only real problem with the mafia theory is the fact that they think that a mafia people would have finished the job, which meh, I don't really know about that. I think <laughs> oh, I'm really, uh, before like I get guy. too far, I think, I literally think it's the mafia. Like that's, I think my, my pick for the whole thing, but we'll get talk about some more stuff. With it. I mean, it could be one of those like uh lone, not mafia related Italian murderers from the Italian. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Not forget about that. No, very not? Let's not forget about that. <laughs> uh, so here's some theories about the letter and, and why it was sent and stuff like that. Not really about who the killer is, but just the intent of the letter. Uh, this is all stuff that I found. I didn't make this up. So this is just why I have to write it because it's fun. Wait, uh, you make some of this up? No. This is, uh, okay. Some of it's just me postulating, being a jackass. But this is uh, not me. This is why it's funny. The Axeman getting revenged against Italians for taking credit for black jazz musicians' music. So it's just some black dude who's just like, got to kill off those Italians because they just stole my music. That um, sounds like a very Italian theory. It does. Yeah. Yeah. It really does. A racist. Uh, <laughs> to be fair to this theory or whatever, a lot of music has been stolen from black people and jazz is one of them. Totally. A lot of everything has been stolen from them. I mean, sure. yeah. yeah. I totally agree with that, but um, I can't think of an Italian saxophone player. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I don't know. Sure, uh, the, the great uh Joey Tony Saxophonio uh of uh of New Orleans back then. He, Tony Saxophonio yeah, the, the the best lips of any eye tie in the land. No one lips the saxophone like Joey Tony Baroni Saxophone. Lips, lips saxophone. <laughs> Joey Tony Baroni Saxophone doesn't sound phony at all, sounds real. Um, Tony, Joey, Tony, yeah, whatever. (laughs) The other reason, here's another theory as to why the letter was even sent to the, the the Axeman is upset about the New Orleans closing of the red light district. So apparently in 1917, the Navy shut down the whole red light district, uh, the gambling dens, the brothels, the dance halls and dance clubs. Yep. So everyone in New Orleans was pissed about that. So they, the one Jack's man's like, let's make it, let's make jazz one last night guys and get my dick sucked by a hooker. Let's do this. With my mistress in my bed and my ex-wife in Chicago. 
Or my, um, my actual <laughs> wife. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks because they didn't want Italians and jazz, and then they shut down the red light district. So, what was Joey Tony saxophone going to do with those lips? <laughs> You're wasting the best Italian lips in all of New Orleans. Joey Tony Baroni Saxophony now eats bologna because he's out of work. Yeah, he can't, he, can't, he can't blow a saxophone. He can't suck a dick. Poor man. <laughs> can't, can't suck some macaroni. All right. I made a rhyme more. Um, uh, the Axeman, here's another theory as to why that letter was even sent. The Axeman was trying to make jazz mainstream. All right. So... He just wanted everyone to listen to jazz so they would understand why it's so amazing. And then not everyone would think it's the devil's music anymore by sending a letter that says you're from hell. I don't, I don't get that one, but that's literally the devil. <laughs> He's like, look, no, I'm the devil. I can tell you there's no jazz in hell. I know that for a fact, cause I'm the devil. <laughs> a better source than me, the devil. I don't buy it. <laughs> All right. So, the last theory about the letter is that if the Axeman didn't even write the letter, which I kind of talked about up uh, top a little bit, Miriam Davis, who wrote The Axeman of New Orleans, a true story. Uh, how many times has a ser insert serial killer or thing that we're doing a true story ever been written? Just me talked about in the show so far. So many times. D.B. Cooper, the true story. Uh, fucking Amelia Earhart, a true story. Actually, her book was shitty. It was called 27 Hours, 15 Minutes or whatever. But anyways. Yeah, and they didn't even yeah, solve yeah. it correctly. Fucking assholes. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so, uh, she wrote <laughs> Axeman, New Orleans, true story. Denies that the real Axeman could have written the letter at all. She says the Axeman was part of the working class, therefore probably couldn't even write. Uh, the Axeman was... Yeah, that's, that's, just, <laughs> that's her prediction. That. How does she know that? How does she know? Because that? of literacy rates in the 1900s, early 1900s. Yeah, they were at zero. No, 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 no. I'm not. No, no, no. I'm not asking about the second part. I'm saying, how does she know that he was a part of the world? Because it would have the way rich people like to kill. Have you ever seen The Purge? And OJ Simpson? Purge is a movie. <laughs> and OJ's. Yeah, that's what you think. <laughs> Just so you have that back in, you know? Come, come to the US. You'll find out. She says. Miriam Davis says that he couldn't have been he probably couldn't even write how does she know that uh Rick I don't really fucking know I'll tell you that much she just did a lot of research on it wrote an entire book so I'm sure she had some sort of reasoning but she doesn't get into it in depth um so I'm just gonna trust the expert I'm gonna trust the expert on this I hate these people that just do bullshit research and then just immediately come up with a theory <laughs> and they spout it on in their book or on their podcast especially when there's like more than one of them you know, <laughs> and just expect everybody to be like, oh, yeah, they automatically know the answer. Right. It's like one it's one person correctly said the California state killer is a cop. And all of a sudden he gets discovered and he was a cop at one point, And they're like, oh, I knew it the whole time. <laughs> I agree with you. I could have been a rich person. Why not? I don't I don't see why it couldn't have been. This is put it this way. This is what she follows that up with. OK, she says uh, it would have to be someone who is very well educated like a jazz musician because she claims it's the fucking guy who wrote uh the axe man jazz why would a jazz musician be any more educated than the fucking working man i'm assuming if you have time to learn how to read sheet music that somebody taught you how to read words i'm just i'm gonna throw that true. out there i don't know if that's definitely real, not true but first of all they're not reading sheet yeah. music at all i was gonna say that for sure they're just yeah playing it has to like, be it has to be music first you're thinking of, um, hey, um, I just want to say I used to play the saxophone. Are you I Joey Chipatoni saxophony? And <laughs> yeah. holy shit, he's here with us <laughs> the whole time. Joey he's Tony Baroni saxophone. I wish I was talking into his mic. I wish I still today. had my saxophone because <laughs> I would, I would, just, with your I would keep it by my desk and just have it ready. Mozzarella stick and baloney. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We've known it the whole time. Yeah, since the second you said that I ate mozzarella sticks, we should have fucking known. Oh, went right oh, over our heads. The house. The call, they're coming from inside the house. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, like I said, she thinks it's the well-educated jazz musician, John De Joseph Davila. Uh, Davila's song, The Mysterious Axeman Jazz, was released almost the same week as the publication of the letter, basically the same night, because I was reading that it was being played up and down the street that night. Is, it, is he related to Corella de Villa? Is that his, his, this guy's wife? <laughs> if so, I have, a, I have a new theory, if that's true. 
Uh, no, Cruella, but I want to hear the theory anyway. And Cruella did it. Obviously, she's killing puppies and people. It's, it's an easy, it's an easy put. You know, the, based on <laughs> based on the aesthetic of the the movie, I believe the timelines match up. So, and there's that, and and, and she, all the X Men wants to do is, or Cruella, sorry, wants to do is kill things at the same intelligence level. And puppies and Italians are the same intelligence level. Oh right? so, yeah, oh, she's oh, like, I want a beautiful fur Italian coat. <laughs> <laughs> Full grown dogs are completely safe. <laughs> yeah, they're smarter than Italians. <laughs> right? <laughs> She's got a scarf made out of women's lips and mustaches. <laughs> and shark and gold shark necklaces. <laughs> Whatever, whoever wrote the letter at the end of the day, it's like it still scared the shit out of the city. Honestly, it probably did as much damage as the Axeman. I'm sure a lot of people got fucked up people thinking they were the axemen so this guy was kind of a dickhead as much as ever. i think john joseph wrote the letter honestly it makes the most sense 100%, yeah uh, really yeah and he he probably did just as much damage as the axemen like a lot of people got injured just like the axemen did not a lot of people died but i'm sure a lot of no people got fucked up. Died, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> here's some fun theories that are out on the internet uh the axeman is a demon well he told us that Exactly. In the letter. Theory. He said he was a demon. The only thing so. we know for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the letter comes from hell, goddammit. He likes jazz, the devil's music. <laughs> he even says he has a close relationship with the angel of death. It must be a demon. The Axeman, here's the other fun one, uh, which I find is outrageous. Uh, the Axeman is a supernatural being that can shrink himself down to a smaller size and make himself like he's Ant Man, like oh, that's why he only needed to cut out that, a little side of the door, and that tracks. Well, we well, were talking I mean, about this. They solved he, it years ago with this fucking theory. Yeah, <laughs> and and he was not he he couldn't control the shrinking very well, so he was he was too tiny when he was trying to swing it. That's why so many people survived. There's only a couple times that he got up to full size, and then he that's when he exactly. got exactly. Yeah, exactly. See, I think his issue was how he had those things that he could like make things bigger or smaller he just would forget to make the axe oh bigger. that's and he's just true they're trying to fucking yeah. like chisel through someone's head got a little ball peen axe the guy would the guy would wake up and like ant-man's on his fucking eye and he's like i just saw this thing standing <laughs> yeah. over top of me perspective hacking through his eyelashes <laughs> like they're tree trunks yeah. but he's so that's such a funny idea he's so close to the eye that you think he's like a normal sized human but it's all perspective a, a large yeah. figure. I'm the demon here to get you. <laughs> I'm from hell. Oh, <laughs> fuck. Hold on. Let me turn the. Oh, shit. How does this thing like, work? We're just killing Italians in a small demon. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the. Uh, well, this one here is my theory, which it's just basically what uh, Darren said off the top is Andrew Maggio is the axe man. DiMaggio. Uh, it wasn't written anywhere. It, it wasn't written anywhere. I just thought of this. Well, put it this way. They accused Andrew of kill, of killing Mr. and Mrs. Joe, like his brother and sister-in-law at the time. He obviously did. I think he did for sure. Uh, but did. I think, yeah, he, he lived with, he was a barber. He lived there. Barber, uh, what a straight razor kills them. A thing a barber has. Who wants to hear their brother fuck in the room next door more than four exactly? Four exactly. I have five brothers, none um, of them can survive that. Yeah, and it doesn't even look like it doesn't even look like someone broke into that house. It looks like someone chiseled out a thing, but like, why mm. could they be so quiet? He could just woke up, came home in a drunken stupor, slit their throats because he didn't want to fucking see hear about them fucking later. Drunken asshole. And then he, he makes like, it look like someone broke in. Lay down already, and he's like. How do you guys feel about Huey Lewis in the news? Like fucking American Psycho, you know? <laughs> <laughs> He's fucking axing his brother up. I have a feeling they're going to be abandoned 60 years. They all, uh, they, the guys close were outside the house, like as if the guy, like Andrew just changed in his room and threw the clothes outside, right? Uh, they also found a red stained shirt in his room, the police. There's a stained shirt in Andrew's room? Yeah, red stained shirt in his room. Yeah, but that, that very easily could have been one of his clients' blood, or like a spaghetti sauce. That too, for sure. It for sure was spaghetti sauce, but maybe also <laughs> blood. 
it ends <laughs> up being wine. They they figured out it's actually wine. Um, hard to tell the difference in you know early 1900s Italians but in science where it was at the time. <laughs> <laughs> The police were so sure that he killed his brother that he wasn't even allowed to go to the funeral. He was held up in questioning for hours, four hours, I believe, that day, the funeral day. They're like, today is the day we're doing it. The razor found at the scene was not the one that killed Joseph and Catherine. It was a different one that they found around near where the axles was found outside. It doesn't change the fact that it could have been him anyway. It's like he handled and Gretel the murder material from his room to outside. <laughs> <laughs> Close. The fucking razor, all leading to the bloody marinara shirt in his room. <laughs> <laughs> really hard to figure mm-hmm. out. So after he gets away with the murder of his brother and sister-in-law, Andrew gets the taste for murder and decides to continue doing it. You know, that's how serial killers usually start. They kill someone and then they continue repeating the pattern over and over. Maybe he hated it and it was just a really elaborate cover that he committed to, to cover <laughs> up his brother's murder. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> what better way to hide your, like, crime of passion and to dilute that, yeah, for sure. Sure. it would explain why he never really killed him, too. I don't really want to do this. <laughs> right? Also, he's like, I'm, I wanted to be the razor killer. They call me the axe. I don't even know. You. <laughs> they monitored him out of six good kills. <laughs> he fucking saddled him with an axe. <laughs> Fuck, Fine, I'll sucks. kill you with an axe. Axe is only two letters. <laughs> <laughs> Three, two, uh, three. Uh, the last theory, which is the most widely believed theory uh, out there, is, and it's the only real suspect they ever had for the Axeman, which is a guy named Joseph Mumphrey. Um, Mumphrey's the Axeman. He was a criminal and ran a blackmailing gang in New Orleans at the time. He tried to blackmail grocers into paying them protection. Right? Like he was an extortionist. He had a little crew of people that would go around extorting. He was in jail actually from 1912 till 1917, like the time when it was quieted down from when they think the earlier murders might have been connected to him. You mean um, the, the previous axe murderers that are exactly the same as the ones that were? They're, they're, they're similar. I wouldn't say exactly the same, but yes, they are very similar for sure. Uh, but he was in jail during that time. And he, when he was arrested in 1919, uh, he had a list of names in his notebook of people he was blackmailing. Not only was Pepitone, remember our buddy Pepitone, he was on that list, but also I Angel don't. Albano. You've said a lot of Italian names. Mike Pepitone. Pepit- Mike Pepitone and his wife. Remember his wife was the wife of six. She had six kids. You think they called him Pepperoni? Like for pepperoni? I would call him Pepperoni. <laughs> yeah, was that pepperoni, pepperoni with the saxophony, Joni Bologna, eating spigatoni. I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> Macaroni. Anymore. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> It's crazy because all of Thank these just Tony. sound like Pete Davidson characters. <laughs> Nothing matters right now other than Spaghetti Tony. <laughs> Continue. Yeah, so Spaghetti, Mike Pepitone. Spaghetti Tony Awards. <laughs> oh, actors. Robert De Niro gets a Spaghetti Tony. Al Pacino gets a Spaghetti Tony. <laughs> Only Italian actors. <laughs> There's no one that acts like a tiger. Caprio. Like a tiger actor. I went to school with Pepitone. He was yeah. a fucking jerk off. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, hope, I hope that he's doing well. It's been a long time, and I hope he's doing well. Maybe he's bet. Maybe he's not such a jerk off anymore. Who knows? He sounds like a jerk off though. He's yeah. Italian. Fucking so, jerk off. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Man, you know, I'm just happy that I'm German. You guys have nothing to attack us. On. Yeah. yeah we, 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 what you, why would you set up a, a target? Why would you be like, my turn? Let's leave the Italians alone. Let's go with the fucking Germans now. I just, I just figured, let me throw some lightheartedness in there for the Italian at home that's just getting their axe ready yes, to go. So like, Germans did do the Holocaust and everything, which I agree is is terrible. Allegedly. Allegedly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm, that's. <laughs> We know the axe murders happened. <laughs> we don't. I mean, if we pull if we pull the scope out a little bit and we just we gloss over the Holocaust and just say World War II, it's straight yeah. to Angela Merkel. I mean, that's well, a winner. yes, but I, I also mean Italians were really bad in World War II as well, and then everything else with them. Hey, don't steal! Hey, don't steal my soul. I'm literally steal just trying answer. to advocate against Italians. I have. No <laughs> All right, that's fine. Then. 
in the That's arms fun. of an angel. <laughs> was that all right? The so when they arrest Bumfrey in 1919, he had a list of names in a notebook the people he's blackmailing. One of them was Pepitone. We talked about him earlier, he was murdered. Uh, another person on there was a guy named Angelo Albano. I'm gonna get to him in a second. Pepitone was the one of the Axeman victims, he was one that left his wife as a widow with six kids. Joseph Bumfrey is the Axeman, is what crime writer Colin Wilson proposes. The way the theory plays out is this. Esther Pepitone, soon after the murder of her husband, Mike, marries a guy named Anglo Albino, Albino, A-L-B-I-N-O, Albino. Uh, she had six kids, so uh, she wasn't going to work. So Albino apparently owed Mumphrey 500 early 1900s money, uh, American dollars. So that's probably a lot of money for, I didn't do the calculations, but it's a shit ton. And Mumphrey being the criminal that he is, when he doesn't get his money, he makes Albino disappear on October 27th, 1921, three years after the last Axeman murder, uh, exactly to the day. And he just disappears. He doesn't, they don't never find his body or anything like that. It's weird how often the follow up crime is on the exact day. OJ went to jail for that robbery shit exactly 10 years to the day after he got fucking whatever. Uh, yeah. Gate was arrested um, for Robert Peake's killing 10 years after he, sh- the day he should have been jail initially for his 10 year bid. It's interesting. It's just twice then. <laughs> but what I, say, I mean, I bet you if we looked into that more, there'd be a lot more coincidences like that. It's all a simulation anyway. It's all, yeah. Right. And, t- and time is fake too. So I guess you can factor that in. Exactly. He disappears. Uh, Anglo. He's gone, but he never paid Mumphrey. A month and a half after he disappears on December 5th, Mumphrey pays a visit to Esther asking for the $500. So he threatened that if she didn't pay up, he would kill her at, like he killed her husband. So instead of paying the money, she just shoots him in self-defense, claims it, and then tells everyone he was the axe man. She goes around telling everyone like, that was the guy that killed my first husband, Mikey. Nice. Mike wasn't the guy with the mistress and the wife in Chicago? That's Charles. No. That was right. Charles Cardinal Moglia or whatever his fucking. Oh yeah, okay, my bad. There's lots of there's lots of people, right? That's just hard. To, I think it was the Italian know. mafia. Did I say that already? Yeah, <laughs> I think it's the Italian mafia. They killed uh, the JFK murder and they killed JFK. Those are two big, they're two big things. So, the problem with the Mumphrey theory is that he's in jail. Let he, only was in jail for that gap between 1911 and 1918. He was also in jail like a bunch of times when the other murders were happening too. And it's hard to track down if this Esther story even happened or if Mumphrey was even a real person. All the uh, shit from records back then are all shit. I don't know how this guy got his, his theory and put it all together. Crime writer Michael Newton is another guy who dug into the solution, and he had a hard time finding any information about any of these characters, like I did. I went and tried to do it, too. The records are old. There are newspaper articles about it. Birth and death records don't really follow, but maybe, maybe not. I don't really know. There's another theory out there. Uh, about copycat killers so once somebody got killed with an axe it just became people start killing people with an axe get away with whatever the fuck you want it's kind of the the mafia vendetta but like it could just be like kill someone with an axe they're saying there's an axe band out there if i kill your friend like if i kill someone with an axe somebody i don't like i'll just blame it on the axe man i'll get away with it uh, so there's like 10 different axe men or whatever the copycat injurer is not a thing that happens though yeah exactly <laughs> copycat maimer <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> nobody kills italians like italians Somebody, you know what i'm saying now, man. <laughs> let's see what uh i can see people have their own theories and i want to see what's going on here there's uh, cholesterol uh, cholesterol probably kills a lot of italians too <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's silent killing <laughs> High blood pressure, man. Why do you think that one blood splatter was seven mm-hmm. feet long? Papacola. It's primed and ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> Mozzarella sticks. Yeah. All right. So I do agree that some of these were probably cap- copycats or faked or, you know, police shoddy, shoddy work by the police. Um, but what I do want to point to is March 13th, 1919 is when the supposed letter was sent to New Orleans. Um, what else happened immediately after that on March 23rd in 1919, Mussolini formed his fascist party. So my theory is that he was using this entire ax murder as a, a campaign. He wrote the letter, right? Mussolini could easily read and write, got his whole campaign started up. And then who disappears? The ax murderer. And when does he become prime minister? 1922. 
And just to put the final nail in the coffin. Hold on, I got so many fucking tabs here. A <laughs> hell of a way to sow anti-American propaganda. By boom, Mussolini holding the pokon. It's an axe. That's in no, Pocon. no. It, it's not just an axe in Italian. It, axes aren't axes in Italian. Then that's not a fucking axe. It's a it's a pickaxe. Yeah, right. Pocon. <laughs> prefixes onto it doesn't count plus they're italian so they don't really know what an axe is i don't know the you time had, you had up. me all there until the you called up. that an axe rick it was four years of being this you think sorry i want i was trying to get you while you're telling the rest of your theory while the axe man song be playing in the background down in new Orleans. <laughs> tell me this isn't some shit that mussolini would hold a fascist uprising for come on <laughs> And I'll tell you what, if there's one person that resonates with the idea of who can kill Italians better, it's fucking Mussolini. Down in the wall, <laughs> isn't, this, isn't this funny, though? This is supposed to be the Scary Axeman song, and it sounds like it's like a, a JRPG in a shop buying potions. The fucking the Benny, the whatever Hill Show song. Okay, either, I don't know what jazz is. That was not jazz. I don't, I don't think I know what an organ grinder is because I, I had a very different image in my head and I don't feel the thing that I created could make that type of music. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a very modern equivalent of what they would have been playing back then. So <laughs> it's like playing off of sheet music on a computer. Um, yeah, it's this fucking, this is the only instrument I've ever seen with wheels. Oh, my fucking god okay give me one more second okay sorry i just stumbled upon something completely by accident okay accident here is the accident. flag of italian fascism <laughs> it's amazing. got a fucking axe on it Dude, you finally found an axe all right yeah all right all right it's an axe. all right agree tell me it's not mussolini it's not mussolini, mussolini running through it's not mussolini but it's mussolini uh running through the sicilians i legit think it's the okay I do like what you're doing here. Uh, I'm not going to discount oh, what you're you. doing. This is funny. Oh, this is, yeah, this is uh, amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you right now, nobody's brought up that Mussolini in all the writings that I've done. What are the so fucking chances that 10 days innovator. later, this motherfucker founds, founded the fascist party? That's wild. I was, I Googled it and I was, that was shit luck. I didn't know that in advance. I don't chances know shit about one, Italy. One to one. Those are the chances. Darren, Darren <laughs> let me ask you a question. Okay. What are are you satisfied with your solve here? That we think it's the well. Actually, what are we gonna go with before, Darren? You got any theories that we could use before I uh, will take yours into consideration before we solve this? Um, I think it was Mike Pepitone's wife. Mike Pepitone's wife just went on a rampage. Yep. I don't know. If she, I don't know if she started it, but she definitely took it over and um, made it. It, it's it's prime prime time was the uh, when it was under the Pepitone old lady. That's fair. Maybe she brought all of her nine kids with her, so that's why they thought it was a big dude. Uh, it was just a lady they, with uh, nine kids on her back. Didn't she lose one? <laughs> was it her lost one? But her two year old? No, it was it was the young couple. Uh, that definitely. Yeah. Oh, all Italians look the same. Is that something I can say? <laughs> <laughs> We can say whatever we want. We're it's a it's a comedy podcast. Well, then what are we going to go with, guys? We're we going with the uh, Sicilians working through fucking Mussolini, um, just I, trying to get rid of I'm, the I'm Italian fine, population. I'm fine with with that theory if we're not going to go with a an out of work uh, and desperate uh, Joey Tony factory worker Peroni, saxophony. <laughs> <laughs> playing with his little macaroni mm -hmm. yeah because yeah nothing rhymes with mozzarella so <laughs> <laughs> lots of fellas rhymes with mozzarella but i'm not getting into that <laughs> yeah, killing lots of fellas not getting into that jumping on mozzarellas <laughs> um uh, and that... and and he's also eating spaghettoni so <laughs> aren't we all Okay, well, we solved it. I think that's pretty good solve. What do you it's think? One uh, of the Rick? two. <laughs> yeah, what do you think? What do you think, Rick? So are you satisfied with your solve, Mr. Wood? 
the only the only reason I'm I can state for sure that I'm completely satisfied is because we fucking nailed it. That's why. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. We nailed it. I have high fives that. all around. High fives all around. And to play us out of this episode today, I will be playing Axeman Jazz. Awesome. <laughs> What? Come on! Hey there, all you private dickheads. That's probably not the name we're going to stick with. Anyways, uh, RJ here. I am here to tell you thank you for listening to another episode of Private Dicks. If you liked what you heard, go on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere they take your reviews, drop us five stars, say something nice. Also, what you just heard was from last season. If you want current episodes as they're dropped, head on over to patreon.com and search up Unethical Podcast. That's our mother podcast. I was not aware Private Dicks was a spinoff. I'm going to renegotiate my contract. On Patreon is a full 16-episode season more of Private Dicks, uncut videos of each episode, and many more things are getting added all the time. You can also find all of Unethical's content on there, so go listen to that. And... If you're already a patron, fuck yeah, dude. You're the best.